This is video two of unit 12. In this video, we will take a look at how the intermolecular forces we spoke about in the first video affect physical properties. So probably the most famous physical property is boiling point. This is the temperature at which a substance boils. And all of these, recall, are physical properties because we are talking about physical bonds in this chapter. So by looking at the boiling point, you could see how strong the forces are. If you take a look at three molecules, F2, which is just fluorine, BRF, and then HF, what you see is you see a progressive increase in the boiling point. F2 is actually a gas at room temperature, and it's a gas even way below room temperature until you get to negative 188. HF, however, is a liquid at room temperature because its boiling point is 19.5. Well, I'm sorry, actually, it's probably just below. It's a liquid above freezing. Uh, room temperature is usually 22 degrees Celsius. So it's almost a liquid, we can say, at room temperature. So what you see here is you see a progression in the increase because of the increase in the strength of forces. Remember that F2 is nonpolar, so it only has London dispersion forces operating. BRF is polar. So it has dipole-dipole forces operating, but HF has hydrogen bonding. And it has hydrogen bonding because you have a hydrogen directly on one of the three most electronegative elements, which fluorine is one of, one of which. So this one has hydrogen bonding in it. Now, recall that every element or every molecule has dispersion forces. So this one has dipole-dipole and London dispersion. This one has hydrogen bonding. It has dipole dipole, it has London dispersion. So <clears throat> you got yourself the strongest bond in HF, and that's why it's highest on the boiling point. And incidentally, water has actually a high boiling point, by definition, of the liquids, even though it's a pretty tiny molecule, and this is because water has hydrogen bonding. Because water has two hydrogens directly on an oxygen, it has very strong intermolecular forces, and that's why water is a liquid and you got to get it pretty high to get it to boil is the idea. Now if you take a look here it says the uh, size of molecules also has a big effect on the strength of these forces and if you take a look uh, these are the halogens remember halogens appear in group 17 of the periodic table and iodine as you go down essentially what we're doing on group 17 is we're going down the group here on the crack table. So iodine is the biggest of the molecules, and if you take a look, iodine is actually a solid. Bromine is a little smaller. Bromine is a liquid. Chlorine and fluorine are both gases. So you can see the progressive increase in the boiling point the bigger you get. Bigger, bigger, and bigger you get to iodine, which is a solid. Now, all of these are nonpolar because all of them are equally distributed. They're just equal on both sides. So you can still be a solid even though you're nonpolar as long as the molecule is big enough. And then here it says bigger, longer molecules have stronger forces than smaller spherical molecules. So if you compare a molecule that's long versus the same type of molecule that's spherical, this one will have a high, high uh, year boiling point. And this is uh, directly due to dispersion forces because all of these are nonpolar. And because they're nonpolar, uh, the only force operating is dispersion force. And the reason dispersion force is so strong in something like iodine is because it has a very big electron cloud. This E means electron cloud. So the electron cloud can much more easily be dispersed to the left side, creating a bigger difference, creating stronger bonds is the idea. And let's see if we can apply this concept. So here's the question. Predict which of the following is likely to be a gas in which a liquid or solid under the same conditions. So in A, you have two chemicals. You have CH4, you have CH3OH. What you realize with CH4 is that this one is nonpolar. Now, you may not see that, but you can think of uh, the 4H is equally distributed around the carbon. CH3OH, however, has this portion right here, and this portion is hydrogen bonding. So since this has hydrogen bonding, We ask which is stronger, nonpolar, which would be London dispersion forces, or hydrogen bonding, 
of course, hydrogen bonding is the strongest. So this one will have the higher boiling point. In fact, CH3OH is called methanol. It's a liquid at room temperature. And CH4 is actually still a gas at room temperature. How about this, these two? How about C3H18 and C3H8? Now, just by looking at this molecule, you see you have more atoms. And because you have more atoms, the molecule is bigger. Because it's bigger, it'll have bigger forces, stronger forces. Now, both of these are actually nonpolar. I know it's tough to see that. And I may have given you that clue. If I ask, I would probably give you that clue. But because this one is bigger, it has the higher boiling point. Um, in fact, it's a, it's a liquid. This is octane. This is what they put in gasoline. This is octane, another word for gasoline. Whereas this one is actually propane, which is a gas. It's used to cook. So try the same idea on your own. Try to categorize these as being liquids or gases. So now what we'll do is we'll say that gases, which we studied in the previous chapter, have no intermolecular forces. So they don't have any attractions. Liquids have strong intermolecular forces. They're definitely attracting each other. And that's why a liquid, uh, liquid, in a liquid, molecules are able to bond and touch each other. In a solid, these have very strong intermolecular forces. That's why solids usually are the closest, the, high, the, the best packed, the closestly packed, and the toughest to melt, you can say. So here are some physical properties. We're going to go through a bunch of them that are affected by intermolecular forces. So density is uh, greatest for solids, which makes sense, because the solids, the particles, have the strongest bonds, so they're the closest together for solids. Liquids, the particles have bonds, but not as strong, so they have a smaller density. And gases, obviously, the particles have no attraction, so the gases are all over the place. So that's why gases have the smaller density. Remember, this is the less than sign. Solids have the highest density. Now, there's a pretty fascinating exception to water. Water, these two are actually flipped. With water, it goes gases, and then solids, and then liquids, which actually has extremely important effects. It makes water as a solid float, and that's why lakes in the wintertime freeze on top, and the bottom of the lake so the lake on top freezes. The bottom of the lake, though, is still a liquid, and little fishies can still survive and have a good time and uh, survive the winter. So very important for gas, uh, for, I'm sorry, for water to have this trend flipped. Diffusion. Now, we talked about diffusion in the gas chapter. We said that diffusion is the mixing, mixing, we said, of gases. We can also apply it to the mixing of liquids. But we know that gases mix very quickly, very easily, because the particles are free to move. Liquids are also free to move, so they mix not as quickly, but they do mix. And here, what you see is you see a drop of food coloring in some water, and eventually that food coloring diffuses, mixes completely with the water. Solids, however, have very, very little diffusion, almost no diffusion, because solid particles cannot move. They're stationary, they're stuck. And here we'll say that diffusion increases with temperature. So the hotter the temperature, the faster the diffusion will happen because particles are moving faster. Let's take a look at some other physical properties. Here are some. And boiling point, we mentioned already, is an important physical property. Another one is heat of vaporization. Now this is connected to boiling point. This is the amount of heat it takes to boil an amount of a substance. So once you get something to the boiling point, the boiling point is simply the temperature at which it boils. Heat of vaporization is then how much heat do you put in to completely vaporize it. So these are similar but different enough. We'll actually use this a little later in, in uh, the notes. Freezing point is similar to boiling point, And heat of fusion is the same thing that heat of vaporization is to boiling. This is the amount of heat it takes to melt a substance. If you get something to its freezing point, if you warm it up, then you have to put enough heat to melt it, is the idea. Something called specific heat capacity how well a substance holds heat. And we'll come back to this as well. Different substances hold heat in differently. Metal, for example, usually has a low heat capacity, whereas water and other liquids have a very high heat capacity. You can heat water up. It takes a lot of heat to heat water up. It does not take a lot of heat to heat metal up. This is because water holds heat much better than metals.
metals we know are good conductors of heat, so they just pass it on. Here is a new physical property that likely you uh, haven't heard of called surface tension. Now, in surface tension, the bonds, it says, are stronger between molecules on the surface of the liquid than on the interior. So this is why, uh, for example, there are bugs like this water crawler that are able to walk on the water. And the reason why is because the uh, surface of the water has a strong film on it. Now, the film is just water itself. It's not, not another chemical. But the reason this happens is because the surface molecules are able to bond more strongly with their neighbors, form stronger bonds, than the interior molecules. And this is because the interior molecules have more molecules to bond with. The surface ones have less to bond with, so they can form stronger bonds. That's the idea. This is also why water droplets actually form spheres, or water in the absence of gravity in outer space would first form spheres. And the sphere is because the surface of the water actually pulls the water molecules in, creating a sphere. There's something called viscosity. Now, viscosity you may have heard of. This is how thick a liquid is. You'll notice water has a certain viscosity, and honey has a different viscosity. Honey is much more goopy, it's much thicker. And the viscosity, by definition, is the resistance of a liquid to flow. So water has a low viscosity, um, and there's not much resistance, we'll say, to flow. But honey has a very high viscosity, high, a lot of resistance to flow. That's why it's so thick. Another physical property. Here's a, another one called vapor pressure. This is likely also a new physical property that you haven't heard of. This is the pressure exerted by the vapor as it evaporates. So every liquid, if you put a liquid inside of a container, like we have here, and then you close the container, the liquid will start to evaporate. But its evaporation essentially will become steady. And the amount of evaporation here, the amount of pressure formed by that evaporated water, is the vapor pressure. The most important thing to say here is that if you have strong intermolecular forces, then you have a low vapor pressure. Because if the forces between the molecules are strong, not many of them will exit into the gas phase and you won't have a lot of pressure. But if the molecules are weak in their forces, then a lot of them will exit, and you'll have a high vapor pressure. That's the idea. And along with this idea, we have volatile liquids, which are liquids that have high vapor pressures because they easily evaporate. So a famous example would be acetone. We'll show you this in class. And all, many alcohols will evaporate very easily. Alcohols are actually found in hand sanitizers because they're able to evaporate and just leave your hands clean. Whereas non-volatile liquids have low vapor pressure, so oil and water actually has a significantly low vapor pressure, even though it does evaporate. Oil definitely. Oil does not evaporate. You can leave it on the table. It will not evaporate because it has a low vapor pressure because the forces are strong. So these have strong forces between the molecules. All right, let's go ahead and try. An example problem, and we'll wrap it up with this example problem. An example problem says, predict which would have the highest viscosity and the highest vapor pressure under liquid conditions. And these guys are liquids. So water, oil, and gasoline. Now we know that oil has the highest viscosity, so 3 on the viscosity scale. We'll do viscosity like this. And gasoline uh, has the lowest viscosity. Water would be in the middle. So Oil is the thickest, flows thickly. Water, a little less. Gasoline, if you've ever tried to flow, uh, pour gasoline, it has a very low viscosity. It pours all over the container, very hard to contain. Whereas the uh, vapor pressure would be the opposite. Gasoline would have the highest vapor pressure because it evaporates so easily. Oil would have the lowest vapor pressure because it doesn't evaporate at all. And water, again, would be in the middle. Water is very often has properties that are in the middle of the two. For B, if you actually look at the chemicals, let's try to do the same thing with chemicals. Here we have the smallest molecule, so it has the lowest viscosity. Again, we'll do viscosity and vapor pressure. And it has the highest vapor pressure. And for this molecule, it's the biggest molecule. It has the highest viscosity, lowest vapor pressure. And this one's in the middle, so this would be 2 and 2. Okay, this wraps up for us uh, lesson 2 of unit 12.